welcome to the show today and our guest is Hilton Smith. Hilton started his career in the liquor business in Botswana and I've known him ever since the early 2000s when he worked in Durban with uh, Team Liquor and Peter Hoyer. Welcome to the show Hilton. Hi Helga, thanks very much. Tell us why did you end up in the liquor business? So I think it was a, a result of circumstances. Um, like I, most of us. Yeah, it was. It, I had a, a funny story, actually. Is I uh, was running a lodge in Botswana, and uh, a woman broke down, and I didn't know who she was, and I went out, and I helped her, and I towed the car, and, and I gave her free accommodation in the lodge, and I sorted her out and sent her on her way. And about a year later, I'd left the lodge, and uh, somebody was looking for a national sales manager in Botswana, and it was a friend of hers. Okay. And simply based on the kind of interaction I'd had with her in that day, she gave me a call and told them and linked us up. And obviously in those days, having available expat people in Botswana was fairly rare. Um, and they got hold of me and interviewed me and I got the job. And I ended up uh, running the sales for a company called Dafin Sales in Botswana from about 98, 97, 98. And did you grow up in Botswana? No, no, no. I'd, uh, I'm a Durban boy. Oh, okay. And uh, I'd been overseas. I'd lived and did the army. I'd been in London for about six or seven years. And then I'd had enough, I moved back and I got a job running the lodge up in Botswana. So, so running a lodge in Botswana sounds like much more fun than running a liquor business. <laughs> it was a lot more fun. And my wife is a, um, a London hotel school. Okay. So obviously with her kind of qualifications at the time and, and myself, kind of just general management skills, we kind of looked after a lodge up in about 200 kilometers, 300 kilometers south of the northern border of Botswana. So it's quite up in the Bundu. Okay, it doesn't mean much to me because I haven't spent much time in Botswana. And so then you started, you worked for a, for yeah. a sales business. So we had a, a sales and distribution business okay. up there. And uh, in 98, um, Vintuk approached us and uh, we won the contract to launch Vintuk into Botswana. And okay. obviously that was the days when SAB was still 98% of the, of the market in South Africa. It was the very early days of Vintuk the yeah. first sort of real opposition and it was quite exciting times because we were part of the the team that effectively launched Vintuk into the market and and tell us about the Botswana market what was the what was available besides was it all SAB and yeah St. Louis there's uh, Kalahari Brewery in Botswana yeah. which is owned by it was a subsidiary of SAB um, even in those days yeah and they had St. Louis which is yeah. obviously their very big brand and, and South African breweries brand so Vintuk was largely initially aimed at the expat market okay. um, and then obviously it slowly built out and I think it's still been still quite a viable brand in the market there yeah. but it's just more expensive. St. Louis is their kind of go-to brand yeah. and being a Botswana a local brand it's, it's, it's huge there. And the local South African or the South African brands are they available yeah, there? Yeah, Castle, yeah, Castle and Black Label and all that sort of thing yeah. yeah. All, the normal, all the normal mainstream brands are all But available. also brewed at Kalahari I'm not sure if they okay. still are. I'm not sure if they are. I know at the time they were brewed up there, mm. um, but I'm not sure now whether they still yeah. do. Okay, so you you got involved with Vintuk fairly fairly early uh, in uh, your career. In the early days, yeah, that was my first sort of exposure to liquor, really, and and and, and I think it's interesting because you know selling beer and selling spirits and selling wine are very different things, and I think yeah. beer kind of has a, a passion. It's, 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 you know, we, we talk about it getting into your blood and once you've sold beer and once you've been yeah. involved in beer, it's very difficult to sell anything else. I agree. It's very <laughs> difficult to move into anything else because yeah. there's just a completely different feeling, a different vibe, a different energy yeah. about selling beer for some reason. It's like we sell happiness and lifestyle rather than a product. It's, a, yeah. it's just an interesting process. You look at a lot of the guys that have been in the beer industry and they've all been in it for their whole lives. Yeah. They don't often move out and then you know, go and sell baked beans or something else. It just doesn't, just doesn't work. Eh? It is, and I, I tried to do that. I tried to help uh, ST Supergroup once with their liquor business, and then I thought, okay, let me try and sell some of the sweets. And it was, it was terrible. I couldn't. I just couldn't get orders. I just didn't know how to sell it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's completely different. I mean, in our business, occasionally you sort of lose focus because you think there's an opportunity, and you try and take on some kind of peripheral brands or something else, and it just, it just doesn't work. Even so. bolting, I've tried, and yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah, you think of it. You know, we try to sell charcoal at one stage because, well, you know, bottle stores, people go and buy beer, they want a bra, they'll buy charcoal. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. 
uh, and did you you obviously stayed in the in the beer business because I met you with with Peter Hoyer and Team yeah, Team Liquor. What happened is is that I'd been two years in Botswana, so we had got it established and we had and we had done it. And and South Africa was then sort of getting to that tipping point that beer gets to, where where it was becoming a bit more relevant, and they were starting to gather momentum, and they needed help. And uh, in those days, Namibian breweries had agents around the country, so there mm-hmm. were different companies that owned the rights. Johannesburg was run by Namibian breweries themselves, but kind of Natal and the Western Cape and so forth were run by agents. And Peter Hoyer and his father Ian Hoyer were the uh, agents through Team Liquor World and Natal at the time. And they needed a bit of help and they needed to help grow. And Namibian breweries facilitated the whole process and the interviews and things. And, and I flew down to Durban and met with Peter and got the job to sort of head up his sales in Natal. So mm-hmm. kind of sales and marketing in Natal was my first role in South Africa for, for Vintook. And we had other brands, but it was sort of 90% focus on yeah. Vintook. And just for the listeners, there is an interview earlier with, which I did with Peter Hoyer a couple of years ago. And it's quite interesting to listen to that, to his vision where he started Vintook. And his dad is, was quite a legend in the liquor industry for, for many, many years. His dad was Mr. Mainstay, I think. I think he actually launched and built Mainstay, yeah. the brand. So. It was yeah. huge in the industry. Yeah. Big legend. Yeah, it was very sad. Ian passed away a little while ago, which was yeah. which was very sad. But so that was from two thousand. About two or three years later, uh, Peter's dad Ian wanted to retire, and Peter very graciously offered me the, op- the option to buy his father's shares in the business. And Peter and I became kind of fifty percent shareholders okay. in the business, which which for me is kind of a young guy at the time. Uh, you know, it was a huge opportunity and it kind of really entrenched me into the liquor trade where I had kind of some skin in the game, so to yeah. speak, and I was actually involved in it. And uh, we so we did really well. I mean, we moved the first year of Vintook, I think I sold a truck in the first year. And uh, <laughs> about about four, four years later, we sold a truck a day in December. Wow. I mean, so the, the growth was just phenomenal. I mean, it was yeah. coming off a, off a zero base, so, I mean, obviously, yeah. but the growth was just incredible. Yeah, uh, I was, can remember those days. And, just exciting. And, and you guys moved into that big warehouse and it was all very fancy. Yeah, it was very fancy. You used to get a lot of stock and used to move a, a great deal. Of. <laughs> and then 2004 happened. Yeah. And that was, of course, then when uh, we had done all the hard work and we had built the brand and we were having loads of fun and we had these visions of this becoming a real, real player in the country. And uh, Brand House got formed and Diageo and Heineken and, uh, and Namibian Breweries got together and we said, well, thanks very much. Um, they offered us all jobs. A lot of the guys moved across and corporate life and I have never really gelled. I've never really enjoyed the concept of corporate life. And I turned them down and said, no, I didn't want to move into the brand house environment and stayed uh, with Peter just running our own business and moved across and uh, started doing a lot of work with Bavaria at the time. Yeah. So I kind of moved into another beer brand and uh, did some work with Bavaria. So I sort of stayed within the the framework of beer and within the liquor industry, but just not in a corporate environment. Yeah. And then that's also with the, with the, at the same time, the guys in Joburg did, did a similar thing, Craig McKenzie and Andre Herman. Yeah. Or was it? Was uh, yeah, it, it was Andre Herman. Andre Herman was our uh, MD of, of Fintuk. So he was, oh, a, he okay. was the South African MD at the time. When That's Brandhouse right. happened, he also then stepped away. He didn't okay. go into Brandhouse. And he actually then moved across and headed up Bavaria for a while. Okay. And Craig McKenzie was our uh, national key account manager at Vintook. And he moved across and headed up the sales for Andre. Mm. So again, it's, it's kind of all the same people just yeah. moving around the industry. <laughs> And that Bavaria, what? How did that go? No, that was you know Bavaria's had a, as you know, yeah. has had a very tumultuous yeah. career in South Africa. They've kind of been in and out and in and out, and it, it's it's never really worked. I know Andre's vision for Bavaria and the Bavaria board vision uh, were very different. Uh, Andre believed that Bavaria should be the biggest brewery in Pretoria. Like literally, you should focus on your direct surround. You should make it as huge as you can, and there's a real market. And when you've got that right, you look at Moving yeah. on, you know the international board looked at it and went, "Oh, but what about the main market? What about Soweto? What yeah. about you know the rest of the country?" And tried to be too much too soon, and uh, it just it never really worked. Yeah, I think it's quite sad. Actually, it was quite a nice beer. It is yeah. quite sad, and uh, I, I I really enjoyed 
visiting the brewery and the in the tap room and it was all all very fancy and uh, yeah i really enjoyed it um and how long did you did you guys do bavaria uh, it was about probably about two years that we okay. helped them with i think until until they actually then pulled the plug and mm. and, and they they pulled out of the country and they closed they, they closed sold they the sold the brewery i think yeah. i think south african breweries bought the brewery if i remember correctly i yeah, think the brewery think was so. sold and uh, the side of flock was somewhere. sold yeah yeah and then uh, about that time you guys took over the nmk business yeah i didn't i wasn't i i was um, on the side of that so i was okay. running our business in durban um so that was never part of nmk Initially, no. So what happened was that Andre um, and a couple of people, Peter and uh, guys that you know, Greg, and people like that got together and, and they bought NMK from uh, Norbert Schultz at the time. Yeah. Um, and they, the, the main, one of the main attractions of NMK at the time was that it had the agency for Stella. Yes. And it was very, very small. So it and attracted all the beer people again. Well, we took it over. <laughs> well, they took it over. I was kind of heading up the sales for them. I got involved sort of right towards the end. I got a bit more involved. But initially, I was just working yeah. for them as a kind of heading up their sales. And we effectively kind of relaunched or launched Stella Artois into the, into the market. So we kind of started again. Yeah. Um, similar process. It's, it's not rocket science launching beer brands. It's, yeah. it's, not, it's not that difficult to do if you, if you understand the market and you understand the intricacies and, and you understand some of the nuances of the brands and we had a lot of fun with Stella yeah, I mean we used to we used to go to Belgium and go and do the international draft pouring competitions where we had South African contestants and and we did we had a lot of fun unfortunately the budgets in those days were a lot less than they are now mm. uh, but we got up to you know reasonable volumes reasonable volumes with it at the time and then once we sort of started getting traction and uh, things didn't work out with with NMK. I think that the business model just just wasn't sustainable. And in 2009, that business closed. Okay. Um, so we had been involved a bit with Budweiser. We were involved with the Confederation Cup, um, and then we closed it before the World Cup. So sort of end of 2009, that business was closed. Wow. And, okay. And we carried on with our existing business. We still had what was then Team Liquor World at the time. Yeah. And, uh, we carried on in a tell, carried on doing what we'd always been doing, just kind of scaled back to being a, a regional business. Yeah, and that was you and Peter. That was Peter and I, yeah. Yeah, okay. And then, sure, we carried on for a few years, and then uh, about 2016, um, I got some financial partners and bought Peter's shares out of business, and okay. he exited. And we turned the business into a national business. Okay. That was when we decided, or I decided that I wanted to expand it a lot more than, than being an hotel-based regional business. Um, Peter was quite happy to kind of exit at that point. And it worked, it worked out very well for all of us, I think. I think he, he left very happy and, and I got an opportunity to try and take the business and try and build it a lot more. And we opened up branches in Johannesburg and Cape Town. And in fact, at one stage, we had a branch in Nelspreet. Really? So we <laughs> kind of took it into a national basis and, and we got all our national listings. So we listed with all the big players, with pick and pay and checkers and all of the suppliers. So we could put ourselves into a national role because it's a bit of a chicken and egg. You can't offer a national solution if you're not listed with all the nationals. Yeah. And you can't supply the likes of pick and pay if you can't supply them everywhere in the country. So yeah. you have to spend the money and, and the effort and open up all your warehouses before you can then pitch to a company to say, I can do your brand because you have to have the infrastructure. So, yeah. so we did that and it, it, it worked. It, I mean, it was a change the complexion of our business, turned us into a, a national business and albeit a small player, at least a, a small national player. And then in 2017, the really exciting thing, we got back to beer. I think we gravitate around <laughs> beer. And before you start talking <laughs> about the beer, I think what... what um, people need to understand is when we started in in the late 90s um, or middle 90s there weren't any chain source everything was regional so you could have a good regional business and just supply all the independent bottle stores which is I think impossible today wow the, that I remember the conversation with Ray Edwards when yeah. he wanted to start tops yes and it was a conversation with him saying this is his idea and he's been given permission to start some tops and will we support him and that was still the Vintuk days yeah where, where every bottle store was a very dodgy, dark, yeah. not very woman-friendly environment. 
and uh, and Ray changed all that. Well, Ray did change it. I mean, yeah. Ray Ray turned it topses, and Tops has changed liquor retail into a, a much more of an English or European system where it looked like a supermarket. Yeah. It didn't look like a dodgy dark <laughs> you know, bottle store. And yeah. I mean that. It, it, at the time we called it and we said I think in those days we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of independent customers and we called it in those days saying that the business will polarize around six or seven big players yeah. which is largely what's happened yeah. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of independent players anymore and that makes it really diffi difficult for a regional player unless you service you the Oncon I think correct correct and the Oncon and Natal is just not big enough the yeah. Natal market is not big enough on its own to be a regional player yeah. anymore so yeah you can't supply Spa in Natal, if you're not supplying them anywhere else. Yeah. So. And Spa in Natal has its own challenges. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> it does indeed. Yeah. So tell us about Superbok. I mean, it is it is an exciting brand, and it comes from a beautiful city in Portugal. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. They, they actually approached me, which is really nice. So they they got okay. hold of me uh, through conduits and and through they did some research in South Africa. And what happened is that historically, Liquor City used to import, yes. still, in fact, still import directly. Yeah. So Liquor City were a customer of Superbox for for many years, and Superbox were on a fairly large growth trajectory as well. At one stage, Angola was doing. A, a ridiculous amount of stock. I mean, something like 15,000 containers a year were going into Angola before mm. the troubles in Angola and, and so forth. And the, the, it was impossible to get Forex. And in fact, Angola has now passed a law that they're not allowed to import foreign beer. They're only allowed no. to produce local beer and so forth. So the international market had its challenges, but they were on a growth process and they were looking for opportunities. And they, and they quite rightly looked at South Africa and said, well, Liquor City have got... Um, up for correction, but I think about 200, 220 stores. And they were doing a reasonable amount of volume, but no one else really was buying from them, obviously. Uh, yeah. Some of the on-trade buy from them, but, you know, Spa, Macro, Pick and Pay, so forth, won't buy from yeah. an opposition company. So they came to the conclusion that if Liquor City could do that kind of numbers with their limited number of stores, if they could open it to the rest of the market, they what do. could they do? Yeah. And they picked us. They they spoke to me. I met them at uh, Johannesburg Airport for a meeting. I was then flown across to Portugal. I produced, uh, presented to the board in Porto, and uh, they gave us the contract to to look after South Africa. Tell us about is, Porto. Porto is an amazing place. I'm going to retire to Porto one day. So <laughs> that is an incredible. Get your visa, oh, your golden visa. It is. It's a, such a beautiful place. So the, the Portuguese. Uh, I'd never been. Well, I'd been to Portugal when I was about 16. I think in about 1985. But I mean that doesn't really count. But I'd never been as an adult. Yeah. And and having lived in London, I'd travelled Europe quite a lot, um, but not Portugal. And Portugal is is for me by far and away the nicest country in Europe. It's the, the people are incredibly friendly. I think they understand, obviously with the big financial meltdown they had some time ago, I think they understand the value of tourism, they understand the, the value of actually making themselves an attractive destination. And as soon as, obviously they can tell you, not, well, don't tell I'm not Portuguese, I'm about a foot taller than the average Portuguese, and, and obviously I don't <laughs> look Portuguese. And uh, they immediately will speak in whatever faltering, broken English, they will try and assist you, they'll try and help you. They, they just really friendly they open they're hospitable they look after us incredibly well when we go to Porto yeah. Porto is obviously where, where Port comes from yeah. the original city where Port comes from so they've, we've been up to the Dura Valley with them it's, even though it's a beer business they've taken us every time I go to Porto and part of the team anyone, any of us go they always make an effort of showing us something else that's Portuguese because mm. they believe the more you understand and assimilate into that Portuguese culture the more you can do for the brand. Yeah. So the port is obviously a part of that. And, and, you know, they've go up into the Dura Valley and actually see how the port gets made and have a look at a lot of the history of the of the country, going to different cities that have got a lot of very interesting history. I mean, Portugal was actually started, I think, with, there was it was part of Spain. And the Spanish uh, queen at the time, uh, her son, I believe, uh, basically went to war with his mother to get independence for Portugal. And there's a city, that, there's a town that's actually designated for that. And there's the, the monuments. and the, So it's, it's a really interesting place. And it's a really, really nice place. Until you put a soccer ball in. Put a football in and, 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 and all bets are off. <laughs> the Portuguese are unbelievably friendly, unbelievably nice people. 
But I was stunned. We, we, they obviously sponsor Porto, Superbook sponsor Porto and uh, Sporting Lisbon. And, and I've been very lucky almost every time I go, end up going to the stadium, to Dragon Stadium and actually watching Porto play. And went out for a beer afterwards. And in South Africa, I mean, if you watch the Sharks play, you go out, you're in your Sharks kit. Or, you know, yeah. if you're watching the Springbok games, you're walking around in your Springbok jersey. And I was walking around in my Porto jersey and they wouldn't let me into the bars. In Porto, they wouldn't let me in wearing a Porto jersey because the potential for conflict is just yeah. too high, is that yeah. a Benfica supporter or another supporter would, would take offense to me walking around. Yeah. <laughs> so the nicest possible people, there's like a shutter comes down where you put a football onto the system, it just changes, it's, just, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. But Porto, is, it's about 900 years old. Uh, there's Porto and Gaia, or the two towns across, across the river from each other, which is now all considered part of Porto. It's all part of the greater municipality of Porto. But it's incredible. I mean, you walk around these, you sit in a bar and it's like a 900-year-old bar. And, yeah. and Superbook and Porto is, is just completely dominant. I think the stat is something like 50% of the beer sold in Portugal is Superbook. Wow. It's one brand's huge. And then you walk around Porto and every outlet, it's, everything's branded. Everything's just, they're just fiercely loyal to their local brand. It's obviously one of the major employers in Porto. And is it still an independent brewery? It's owned by between, there's a family that are still involved mm. and obviously the banks nowadays yeah. are heavily involved. Um, but effectively it's independent. It's not one, not part of Another any of the, any of the brewing breweries, houses. any of the changes. No. Yeah. Uh, and everything's brewed in Porto. They don't, they don't brew under license anywhere else in the world. So all the beer comes from Porto and is then shipped around the world. And they've got good markets in China and America and places like Vietnam and obviously South Africa and Mm. So they, but they're lovely people to deal with. They, they just, they're just incredible. And yeah. the market in Portugal, remind me who the the big brands are. Sagres is Sagres, their is yeah. their is their direct opposition. I remember um, that from NMK days. I think. Yeah, yeah uh, those are the only two real players. Yeah. Between those two, I think they're probably. I'm not sure the exact number of Sagres, but I would imagine they're probably around eighty percent of the beer mm. market is probably just those two brands. There. And uh, a lot of dark beer. They do do start, yeah. Um, but that's a lot of that goes into Africa. So they're yeah. very big in in sort of East Africa, the Congo, places like that. They do they do a lot of business in start, okay, rather so than traditional, traditional traditional mini. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the dark beer. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, it's I've I've watched you from a distance as you travel to to Porto with <laughs> lots of envy and. <laughs> No, yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun. It's an, it's an amazing brand. And in South Africa, our traction has been incredible. We, we liked it. When we first got presented, I kind of looked at it, and, and there's just something about it that resonates here. And I think a lot of it's to do with, the, the, obviously, the taste profile. It's a, it's, a, mm. it's a remarkably good beer. It's, it's very sessionable. It's, it's really, really easy to drink. Uh, it fits into the hot climate in South Africa very well. But also the branding, just the simplicity of the branding. The colors are very strong, the reds and golds and mm. so forth. They remind you of, of other brands that, that are fairly big in South Africa. But it, it just works. And it's, it, the acceptance and the adoption rate that we've seen has been remarkable. Uh, we've, we started with minis, and that was fairly slow because obviously it's a 250 mil, and educating South Africans to drink more smaller beers rather than less larger beers is quite difficult. Yeah. You know, as a nation, we tend to tend to want the most beer for our money. Yeah. Uh, you know, we think, I mean, you have one liter bottles and so yeah. forth and trying to get the mindset around have three 250s rather than two 330s and yeah. keep them cold and fresh is a long process. But we launched Draft about a year after that and Draft has just changed the game for us completely. It's, it's changed our whole business. Our business has moved back into the old days it's been a full circle into much more of an on-trade driven business so probably 70% of our business now is on-trade and draft yeah. because it's draft and yeah. it's, it just you know draft is just is just incredible it's, it's the towers the fonts that we've got are very very impressive they really really look nice um, everywhere where we are it just accelerates the growth we find that we outsell a lot of the kind of mainstream brands that we're next to we sit at a kind of premium price point, but for a fully imported beer, I think people understand that. And it's just, it's, it's been incredible, the, the growth of it and the potential of it. And we now, it's, it's very interesting, you know how it works, is that two years ago when we started Draft, we had to well, not, not beg people, but really kind of ask people to support us and do it. And 
we have probably probably five or ten a week now approaching us. Yeah. And places that two years ago said to no, we're not doing we don't need another beer, are now coming back to us because they've seen it, they've seen it in other other venues. Consumers are starting to ask for it. People are actually going in and saying, How come you haven't got Superbook when so and so down the road does have it and and yeah. so forth. So it's it's been exciting. And it's and do you think that the large Portuguese community in in the liquor industry or in the I guess the hospitality industry has helped. Absolutely. Because oh, they, absolutely. Love, they love the brand. Absolutely. Our, our, our strategy was quite simple, is that we started targeting what we call ethnic. Mm. Uh, so we, we kind of have three categories. We have ethnic, ethnic transitionary, and non-ethnic. And, and just to explain what that means, is ethnic is Portuguese with Portuguese people. So mm. that's a, a Portuguese restaurant that caters, or a Portuguese club is a good example. Mm. So the Portuguese sports club in Cape Town. Like we did with Bavaria at exactly, the German club. Exactly the same mm. Exactly the same principle. So we started in key Portuguese places because that gives you credibility. Mm. And if you're in the top Portuguese places, then when you move into the next level, they look and say, okay, all those Portuguese places have got it, so it must be authentic because yeah. Portuguese people wouldn't have a Portuguese beer if it wasn't an authentic Portuguese beer as a, yeah. as a mindset. And we started with our kind of focus point was Portuguese outlets. And then what we call ethnic transitionary is a Portuguese outlet that has non-Portuguese consumers. So a good example of that um, are, are places that Portuguese restaurant that's in a non-Portuguese area. Mm. So as opposed to the south of Joburg or where a lot of the Portuguese people inhabit, yeah. you take a place in Santon, for instance, or somewhere like that, or you know, in the middle of Durban North, and it's Portuguese owner, but it's non-Portuguese consumers. Okay. They want to have a Portuguese experience, mm. and that started working. And then our, our completely non-ethnic are completely unrelated. And interestingly, what's really nice is that I think – Four of our top five outlets in the country are all completely non-ethnic. Mm. So the brand has now got to the point where our biggest customers are non-Portuguese, no Portuguese owner, no Portuguese theme, no Portuguese consumers. It's a South African normal, That's not normal, not San Portuguese yeah. abnormal, but you know what I mean? Like a non-Portuguese yeah. environment. Yeah. And those are our biggest outlets, wow. which, which gives us an idea of how the acceptance is. If it was just in the Portuguese places, everyone would think, well, okay, Portuguese guys are supporting Portuguese beer. Mm. But and you can only grow that much. Correct. Yeah. But it's the non-Portuguese is where the, where the real growth is. Yeah. And we haven't even looked at the main market. I mean, this is just the formal market that we're yeah. talking about, and it's, it's just flying. So, I mean, traditionally, that would have worked for any beer. So, a, a singer would have worked in, in what is Thai restaurant. A yeah. Thai restaurant and uh, Indian Indian, what was the Indian? Well, Cobra. Well, that's how Cobra did it. Like, like Cobra. Yeah. Like Cobra did it in the UK. Yes. Co Cobra launched and they went into 5,000 Indian restaurants yeah. in the UK. That was their strategy. And that worked. And then they, yeah, I don't know how big they are relatively. I don't know how mm. big they can grow beyond that. But absolutely, it's the same yeah. principle. I mean, if I go to a, a, a Japanese restaurant, I'm more likely to try a, a Japanese, Japanese product or yeah. whatever it is. I'm more yeah. likely to do it. I think a lot of people are the same. But the trick is, is you've got to get them, obviously, to enjoy it and then find it in their non-Portuguese. So they yeah. go to a Portuguese restaurant for their, well, the Portuguese hate it when Portuguese restaurants in South Africa are not what the Portuguese consider Portuguese restaurants. It's quite funny because <laughs> Portuguese restaurants in South Africa are actually predominantly Mozambican. Yeah. And Mozambican Portuguese food is, is very different. Walls apart. Uh, my first trip to Portugal, I was very confused and I kept uh. asking where the spicy flat chickens were and, and they don't do any of that stuff so it's all about fish and it's a, it's a completely different different yeah. way of eating but what we perceive as Portuguese food in terms of Mozambique and Portuguese spicy food Nando's well yeah Nando's is a takeaway yeah. but you know, there's a lot of a lot of there's actually a remarkable number of Portuguese restaurants in this country that you don't realise until you start dealing with the trade and, mm. and we start investigating having a brand like we've got you realise how many Portuguese restaurants there are yeah, that's it's obviously very popular with South African people as well. It is popular. So give us a few. And I know it's difficult, but like really authentic Portuguese, but yeah, outlets or destinations that one can visit. Well, if you want really authentic, obviously um, Perinha, La Perinha in, in Johannesburg is legendary. Yeah, uh, I mean that's been there for forty three years, I think this year or something like that. Is wow, is incredible, um, and they. It, it, that's real Portuguese, run by Portuguese, owned by Portuguese. It's, it's, I mean, you get proper bacalhau, so you get real Portuguese food there. 
as well, which is, is fantastic. I mean, it's it's an interesting um, venue. It's got so much character, so much history. Okay. And, and that's the kind of place. Those are the sorts of places where we went into that gave us the kind of real, real credibility. Yeah. Um, if you're talking about real Portuguese restaurants, I mean, there's there's in every city we've got strong Portuguese places. I mean, places like uh, Juitas, places like Barra Alta and Belita, Juitas yeah. and Mshlanka offer really good Portuguese food. Offer obviously with Superbook, because yeah. it works really well. Um, in in Cape Town, you've got um, I always said incorrectly, but uh, Pacheticos, which is a, a, a real Portuguese. If we we in um, about sure there's about six or seven very strong Portuguese outlets in Cape Town there's quite a strong Portuguese community yeah. down there and it, it's it's just growing all the time yeah wonderful um, and the the bottled beer bottled bottled beer is a lot smaller than than draft because yeah mm -hmm. I mean you've you've spent a lot you've done invest you've invested money I mean I've seen the fridges Look, the nice thing about Superbook, um, and I think it was one of the mistakes potentially that Vintook made, is that Vintook Lager and Vintook Draft weren't the same beer. So it's a very different taste profile okay. between the two. Superbook's the same beer. So there's a very slight, uh, um, bitter, slightly higher bitter content because, and I think it's probably to do with the pasturation or there's something to do with when they, when they bottle it into Draft, it just changes very, very slightly, but it's but it's a minuscule change. Mm. So effectively, if somebody drinks the draft and they then go and buy the bottle, it's a very similar really experience. Similar. And I think that's quite important. And that's what we're trying to do is that we're building it with draft and then offering it in the off trade so that those consumers that see it or try it in the on trade, because again, you know how it works. It's trial. Somebody doesn't want to spend 250, 260 rand on a case of beer that they don't know. Mm. Whereas they'll spend 45, 50 rand on a draft that they potentially don't know, yeah. especially if the if the barman or the waiter sells it to them, they'll try it. They drink it, oh, that's really nice. Then they walk into a bottle store and they see the same product again, there's more chance of them buying it. Yeah, definitely. It's a good place to experiment. It is a good, it's a good place yeah. to play. Yeah. But uh, it's interesting because, again, we talk about the different drinking processes, is that in, in Portugal, if you order a draft, you'll automatically get a small one. You'll get a, a 250 or 300 mil, or maybe a 350 if you're lucky. You'll have to specify if you want a 500 mil, and they'll yeah. probably have to go try and find a glass for you okay. because they just don't drink like that. Whereas yeah. in South Africa, if you order a draft, you automatically get a 500 mil. Yeah. And it's just it's, it's, it's trying to understand the different kind of processes and the different way that the population drink and the different way that they enjoy it. It's just, just quite intriguing. And the Portuguese find it amazing is that we, we only drink 500 mil draft generally. Yeah. So it's just a different, very different process. Okay. You know, I think, and I, and I had this message to my team recently, is, is, is I think that the success we had at Vintook was, was the team that we had and the brand that we had. And that's why it worked. I mean, we were fighting almost insurmountable odds in those days with the kind of power of, of, yeah. of the likes of South African breweries and, and just how dominant and how big they were. And I really feel that we've, I've managed to do the same thing again. We've created a team that's incredible. We've created a dynamic, uh, strong, really motivated team. And we've got a brand like Superbook that is incredible. So the current circumstances are disastrous. They, 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 you, know, you want to sit and cry, you know, curl into the corner and die. But you, know, you kind of keep looking at, at, at what we've got, the people we've got, the brand we've got, and that you know, this too shall pass, as they say. And yeah. As difficult as it is, when this is gone, we poised to really take this brand a long way. And I think yeah. that's exciting for us. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a kind of five and 10 year process, not, not looking now at one year. And, mm. and I believe, I really believe that, that lockdowns aside, let's assume that we get vaccinated and this nonsense goes away. Uh, you know, I think in, in, in the next five years, Superbook will be a, a, a real contender. I think that it, it has the potential and it has the ability to be a real player in South Africa in a premium category, obviously. I mean, we're not talking about taking on the, the, the returnable court market, but we're just talking about playing in the game that we're in in terms of the premium market. It's, it's fantastic. I think the opportunities in the future are, are very bright. 
Yeah. And I think that the, the trade is, is also still rooting for somebody that's able to take on the big boys. Yes and no. The, the, yes and no. They, they, they do. I think, I think in principle they do. Um, but, you know, we still have on-trade outlets that are exclusive to certain breweries, which, which is kind of from the old days, you know, yeah. where, where, where certain, certain breweries or certain suppliers, uh, you know, I, don't, I don't know how they do it. They, they, they make an offering or they do something that, that the, the, the owner decides or is coerced or whatever into, into only stocking one suppliers brands mm. which is which is quite unusual in the current market because i mean i think we've spoken about it over the years but the change if you look back at the beer market 20 years ago when we started in those days they did the stats that said that people the people were most loyal to beer it was the single alcohol product that carried the most loyalty and that only every three years were people ready to change brands. Wow. So you were fighting against somebody that, that they, they were so set in their ways. To get them to try a new beer was very, very difficult. That's all changed. The, the, the onset of the flavored vodkas, uh, the onset of craft gin, and then the craft beer explosion changed people. People are now actually, they see it as, as almost a kudos thing to try something else mm. that they're actually prepared to try so it's changed the mindset and that's made all of our jobs easier made our jobs easier it's made the jobs for the big guys harder because people are prepared to try other things people are prepared to experiment a bit but it's made our job much easier in that if we give an attractive well-priced really decent intrinsic product people are try it and mm. if they like it they're happy to drink it and I think that changes the game a lot from all new brands and I think, in in with, you know, with the experience of the craft beers that are on the market, a, a premium imported beer is also not that expensive anymore. Well, correct. We cheaper than we cheaper than craft beer. Yeah. So we sit at a price point which is similar to something like Stella. So it's kind of in that premium premium category mm. at a at a reasonable price point. So we generally sit at about ten or fifteen percent above mainstream. But the discerning consumers are happy to pay. And I mean, at the end of the day, when you're in the on-trade and you're sitting in a restaurant and, and you're probably spending, I don't know, 250 rand a head on your food, if you spend 50 rand on your beer or 45 rand on your beer, it's not often it's not that big a deal. Yeah. And you're getting something that, that you enjoy and you think that's better. I mean, it's not, you know, we're not sitting at double the price or anything like that. And in the off-trade, in the bottles, we sit at uh, a very similar price point to kind of mainstream premium but with a 250 more. So what okay. you're doing is you're paying the same RAND value, but you're getting a little bit less volume. So your premium status or your premium element is really in the volume rather than the price, mm. which is really why we brought the 250 rather than the 330. Because at least from a, a psychological point of view or from an emotional point of view, people say, okay, I'm going to go and spend 250 RAND on a case of beer. They can still spend 250 RAND on a case of beer. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Hilton, thanks for joining us today. Where can people find follow you on social media? You qu yeah, is the, the it's either hashtag Superbook SA okay. uh, or hashtag the Bev Imp. So we changed the name. We didn't talk about that, but we changed the name from uh, Team Liquor World to the Beverage Emporium yeah. some years ago. Uh, so it's just hashtag the Bev Imp. And uh, they can follow that. We do have a website and we do do some social media activity. And obviously, things like this, once we get this from you, we kind of post these mm. sorts of things. A couple of other podcasts we've done with other brands and so forth. And we try and give a bit of inf information every now and again. Try and not quite at your level, but try and uh, yeah. add a bit of value to people yeah. in terms of stuff that we know about. And but they can certainly find some outlets where they can enjoy a super book on tip. Correct, yeah. We've got, oh, we've got a lot. Uh, we've got about 100 draft outlets now, and we've got a budget for about another 300 in the next two years. So it's, it's growing all the time and becoming more and more prominent. So. That's very exciting. Um, and one more question. In KZN, where is the best place to enjoy a... Well, you see, I'll get into trouble with I the know rest. You do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I mean, from where from where I live, obviously Stokers is, Stokers. is, is, is my go-to. Everybody knows Stokers. Everyone knows Stokers. Everyone knows Guy. It's been around for for I don't know. I think it's been around longer than than Clouf yeah. has. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's been a lot. Um, as I say, obviously, uh, the restaurants in town, uh, well, in in Schlanger and Belito, um, in Durban North at the old Riverside. Okay, we're in there with a the crowbar on the Riverside. Uh, little Portugal down the south coast. 
Thirsty Whale down the south coast, Brew 71 in, in Scottborough. So we've got quite a few. Yeah, all over. Well, th- th- that's sort of the idea. We have, we have two strategies. There's one is that we try and make sure like that that we've covered kind of KZN. But KZN is obviously very small for us in the scheme mm. of things. Um, and then we also have a lot of clusters. So in Johannesburg, we, we have, I think, close to 60 draft outlets in Johannesburg. Uh, so it's, it's all over the place. And then another 30 odd in, in, Cape, in Town. Cape Town. But they're all grain all the time. Yeah. So. And, and those, I'm sure you share information on your social media. For Correct. When you do those installations. and Correct, yeah. yeah, yeah. Good outlets to, to visit. Yeah, so people can see it. So as I say, you've got Portuguese outlets, you've got mm. bars. I mean, you've got, um, you've got places like the House of Machines in Cape Town, which is, a, which is a, a fairly small but very trendy, really, really nice bar that offers sort of premium coffee, premium food, premium beer. And it's it's completely non Portuguese, but it rocks in the middle of Cape Town. It's we actually sponsor the the open mic, so we get involved in music, and we help them out in terms of allowing local talent to to come and actually play and kind okay. of be heard and to expose themselves and that sort of thing. So we try and get involved in lots of those sorts of things. Okay. And most of the trade knows where to find you. You've been around long enough. <laughs> been around a while. And they yeah. can supply everybody. We've yeah. certainly supplied everybody at some stage. At some stage, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Good. Thanks, Hilton. Thanks for taking the time out of your not-so-busy yeah. schedule. <laughs> my enforced holiday. <laughs> my my two-week break. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Holger. Okay. Thanks. We'll chat soon. Okay. Okay.